So it's a great pleasure to introduce to you our research paper. And to start with, my name is Brian Saunders. I'm the head of the Wolfson Unit for Endoscopy at St Mark's Hospital in England. And uh, I'd like to introduce my research colleague, Zach Teamoulos, who's sitting alongside me, who compiled the data for the paper. You can see the video running, and we're going to talk a little bit about the technique of endoscopic mucosal ablation, which is a new technique which combines two well-known modalities, submucosal injection and then our argon plasma coagulation. But there is a difference, Zach, and what, what's the difference in what we're doing with this? Uh, the difference is that uh, endoscopic mucosal ablation, as you said, is a combination of two conventional uh, endoscopic techniques. Uh, by combining the submucosal injection of normal saline with or without a boost of uh, viscous solution in combination with high power of argoplasma coagulation preceded the, uh, by the injection. So uh, when you say high power, what do you mean? Do you mean, I mean, our standard power settings for using APC, for instance, in the left colon would be 50 to 60 watts. What's high, high power here? Hydrogen uh, resistance is represented by uh, uh, very high power energy of uh, 45 to 55 watts on the right column and 65 to 75 watts on the left column. And just to, just to clarify, that's using uh, the uh, standard Urbe ICC 200 diathermy unit. So what sort of lesions are we targeting this therapy at? Uh, most of the cases there are very uh, fibrotic recurrent uh, lesions uh, following piece milliamma or incomplete ESD. Here at St Mark's, and I suspect worldwide, we're seeing an increase in the number of large sessile lesions which are being detected, mainly as part of bowel cancer screening. And quite often these cases are being partially resected with recurrent polyp, then being referred into tertiary referral centres such as St Mark's where we have to perform rescue therapy. And this is where the EMA technique really comes in. Some of these lesions have more than 30% uh, based with submucosal fibrosis. And that's severe fibrosis where you don't get submucosal lifting. And in that situation, the combination of partial resection with the snare and then EMA ablation comes into its own. What are the advantages of EMA ablation? Endoscopic mucosal ablation is easily applicable, is quick, and appears to be a safe technique. When you say safe, what do you mean by that? In our series, what were the complications? Out of the 14 patients in this study, there was only one delayed hemorrhage that required hospitalization and no endoscopic intervention. Or transfusion. Or transfusion. For those of you watching the video, I would draw your attention to what we call the melt effect. This is when applying the high energy APC, we see a propagated thermal effect destroying the entire mucosal layer and most of the submucosa. With submucosal injection, we expand the submucosal space and we enhance the electrical propagation of the thermal destruction. This is protective phenomenon. It is justified by the higher heat capacity of the fluid and is named heat sink effect. When there's severe fibrosis, it can be difficult to get submucosal injection. However, even a small amount of fluid can be beneficial and allow you to use the EMA technique. We've found that boosting the submucosal injection with hyaluronate, a more viscous solution, is helpful. Even fibrotic segments up to about two centimeters can be destroyed with the EMA technique and very rapidly. In our study, what, how long did it take to perform EMA? So, yeah. The longest duration was eight minutes. So it's a really very quick and easily applicable technique. There are concerns, however, about destroying tissue. We're not sending this tissue for histopathology. So what sort of things do we need to look out for? We assess the polyp meticulously with NBI and on optical grounds, if uh, there is a suspicion of malignancy or a pit pattern distortion, then we back off and uh, we don't perform EMA. In this cohort, 87% of the patients with these very fibrotic lesions ended up with a complete resolution using a combination of piecemeal EMR with the EMA technique. So in these patients, we can say that an endoscopic solution was found for their lesion 
rather than requiring colectomy. However, there were two patients who did require surgery. One had recurrence in the rectum and, and had a TEM, successful TEMS procedure, and another was found to have early adenocarcinoma and had a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. Why we don't, we don't perform ESD in these cohort patients? Well, that's a good question, and ESD is the alternative endoscopic technique for these types of lesions. However, ESD is technically very difficult and risky. Recent publications have suggested high perforation rates, particularly where there's severe submucosal fibrosis. In our data so far, we can apply the EMA technique safely, and in the vast majority of fibrotic lesions, we get a good, complete result. Obviously, we need to do further studies. What's the future? In our plans is to expand our study and have a larger prospective database uh, regarding the endoscopic mucosal ablation technique, including uh, upper GI in the stomach, like in watermelon lesions or in the esophagus. But this still is... So the EMA technique can be used in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. For instance, for flat duodenal polyps, it might be an option. For vascular lesions, again, it may, it may be a good option. Although the EMA technique is an excellent rescue therapy, I think we want to emphasise that it is not for standard destruction of polyps. Where possible, histopathology, particularly for larger or flat sessile lesions, needs to be as complete as possible. So we only recommend EMA when there is severe fibrosis and an alternative such as ESD would be a complex and risky procedure. So we hope you enjoy reading the article and watching the video.